Hello and welcome to the PCOS Nutritionist Podcast. If we haven't met yet, then my name is Claire. I'm a registered nutritionist and I have a background in exercise science and natural fertility education. And I have PCOS too, so I know how frustrating the symptoms can be. But I also know what it's like to be on the other side of that now and know how manageable the symptoms can be as well. So my story is that I developed PCOS when I was, well, I don't know really when I developed it, but it was, I, I was diagnosed when I was in my mid-twenties after years of being an elite athlete and struggling with uh, weight gain, even when I was eating a very, very, very low calorie diet and exercising uh, more than 20 hours a week training. Um, I was struggling with acne, completely missing periods for three years. And it was only when a very kind doctor could put all of those symptoms together and tell me what was causing it that I finally got an answer. But I didn't get a solution. All I got was, well, here, go on the pill and that will give you, well, they said it would regulate your cycle. What I now know is that would give me a bleed. It was not making me ovulate, so it wasn't really regulating my cycle. The pill and low-dose antibiotics for my acne, which were okay but then stopped working after a while and then also nothing you know I was told when I said well actually one of my main symptoms is that I have this weight gain which I don't know why because I'm eating so well I am a you know registered nutritionist and I'm exercising heaps and their only answer was well you might just have to do a bit more people with PCOS just need to eat a bit even less and exercise even more (laughs) and I was like I'm not quite sure how we're going to do that because literally my exercise is already twice a day, 20 plus hours a week, uh, and I'm already following all of the sports nutrition guidelines. Like literally if I eat any less, I will not be able to exercise or compete. So, uh, and they didn't really have an answer to me apart from metformin, right? And so that had led me into doing my own research and, and given that I had a background already as a registered nutritionist and exercise scientist, I thought, well, if they can't figure it out for me, then I'm going to have to figure it out myself. And that led me on to many, many more years of study in specifically in PCOS and where I am today. But today we're not talking about me. We are probably talking about you and your symptoms, your PMS symptoms or PMDD, which stands for premenstrual dysmorphic disorder. And it's the more severe form of PMS. Now, the reason we're talking about this today is because I had an experience uh, about three weekends ago now where I went away uh, for a weekend, lovely weekend with a group of good friends, girlfriends, and we were all chatting and because we're all very open and also because of what I do for a job, uh, we always talk about periods and stuff. And so all of what sort of came to light over that weekend is that every single one of them Although none of them have PCOS, every single one of them had symptoms of of either PMS or even more severe PMDD that were affecting their relationships, that were affecting their lives, their hobbies, their well, their mood, because and that was what was affecting a lot of these other things, and just their ability to, you know, go three weeks without getting a period. And I've also noticed a big upward trend in the number of women I'm working with in the protocol, the PCOS protocol, which is the way that I work with most of women that I see, um, that many of them were also getting symptoms of severe PMS or PMDD that hadn't been recognized and hadn't been treated. And most of the time, these aren't just a fact of life. Your period can just arrive. You do not have to have the massive irritability, mood swings, depression the week before your period, the the cravings, the bloating, the uncontrollable crying, the insomnia uh, or difficulty sleeping, the difficulty concentrating or any of those symptoms. You can't, your period can just arrive without that week of horror beforehand. But firstly, what is PMS? What is PMDD? Well, PMS, like PCOS, is a syndrome, right? And what a syndrome is, is basically a group of symptoms that uh, we've defined into a name so that we can categorize it better. So same as like irritable bowel syndrome. So it's the, if you have um, many of these symptoms, you will be told, okay, that's, those are being caused by PMS or premenstrual 
syndrome doesn't necessarily tell us very much about what's actually causing it. And I think this is where our conventional medicine fails to really help many people with syndromes is because it's like, oh yeah, okay, it's this. We know that this is what's causing it, but we don't necessarily have a great fix for that. And I'm sure any of you you know, who have suffered from a syndrome like PCOS is well aware of this. There are some medications that can help suppress symptoms, but most of the time it's not actually addressing the problem and many of those symptoms aren't addressed. Like your doctor might say, okay, we'll put you on the pill. You say, okay, but doctor, my main symptom is weight gain. How is that going to help my weight gain? And they're like, oh, well, it's going to regulate your period. It's like, yeah, but that's not really my concern. My concern is my weight gain. Or, um, okay, let's put you on a low-dose antibiotic for your skin. Okay, cool, great. But um, is this going to have any long-term effects? Well, maybe not, but maybe, yes. And or spironolactone so okay cool so but what about when I get pregnant how am I going to deal with my skin when I get pregnant because I can't be on spironolactone when I get pregnant so same thing happens with PMS it's uh, and and the reason for this is because our conventional medicine system medical system is not well set up for dealing with chronic conditions our doctors aren't given time to assess you and figure out what's actually driving this hormonal imbalance for you and that's really what when it comes down to PMS that's really what it is and so uh, had they you know were they given you know half an hour 45 minutes an hour with you then yes likely they would be able to identify what's going wrong and and get you an appropriate treatment but 10 to 15 minutes very very hard and so the outcome has to be either a medication and that's why often people with you know, PMS or PMDD will be told, well, you could go on hormonal birth control. And the reason why that can help, it's true, it can help, is because that stops you from ovulating. And so you're not getting this uh, hormonal rise and fluctuation. But it's not necessarily fixing it over the long term. And many people don't want that outcome. Like, you know, you might be trying to conceive and you don't want to be um, getting you know, really depressed the whole entire week before your period. And that's totally valid concern, right? You can do both. Or it might be that you just don't want to be on hormonal birth control. You want to ovulate naturally. And so you should be able to do that without having this week of horror before your period. So PMDD, that is premenstrual dysmorphic disorder. And again, uh, it is just the more severe form of PMS. And really what differentiates them is just the severity of symptoms. So I'll talk you through the symptoms and then the differences in what how PMS is diagnosed and how PMDD is diagnosed. These include irritability and, you know, feeling depressed the week before your period and this can actually extend to two weeks before your period so it's more common to be the week before but for many women that this extends anywhere from ovulation all the way through um mood swings irritability anger appetite changes so you might be you know really uh really hungry craving trouble falling asleep insomnia um just being socially withdrawn so not really wanting to see many people Poor concentration, uh, tension or anxiety, crying spells, bloating, uh, and the list goes on. I'm sure you, if you can, you can Google it and you'll find a list of many, many, many symptoms that are uh, caused by pain. And many other physical symptoms like joint or muscle pain, uh, headaches, fatigue, weight gain, and that's due to fluid retention. Uh, as I said before, bloating, breast tenderness is another really common one. Uh, acne flare-ups, very common, uh, constipation or diarrhea, and interestingly, alcohol intolerance. So you might find that especially your tolerance to things like wine, which I'll talk about in a minute and due to its histamine connection, uh, can severely can be severely reduced in sort of that week or so before your period. Also change in libido is another very, very common one as well. So you may be listening to this thinking, tick, tick, tick. This is me. Why has no one ever spoken to me about this before? And that is really because PMS is deemed as something that's normal. Now, I wouldn't say that it's normal. I would say that it's common, but it doesn't have to be that way, especially if you're getting the more severe form PMDD, premenstrual dysmorphic disorder. Now, PMDD includes all of those symptoms, but 
also in sometimes a lot more of a severe form. So uh, could be things like lack of control, nervousness, agitation, severe fatigue, severe depression or anxiety, um, you know, uncontrollable crying, uh, m- really severe kind of moodiness, trouble sleeping, really bad insomnia, um, numbness or prickling, tingling or heightened sensitivity in your arms or legs, heart palpitations, muscle spasms are some of the other symptoms. And the diagnosis is described as um, if over the course of the year, during most of your menstrual cycles, if you have five or more of those symptoms. So the symptoms would be depressed mood, anger or irritability, trouble concentrating, lack of interest in activities you normally would enjoy, moodiness, increased appetite, insomnia or the need for more sleep, feeling overwhelmed or out of control, or other physical symptoms, the most common being bloating, breast tenderness, and headache. And so it's it's got to be, you've got to have five or more of those in most of your cycles throughout the year, plus they disturb your ability to function in social work or other situations, and they're not caused by or related to another medical condition. Now that one's a little bit tricky because I think a lot of people would put stuff down to, oh, well, that's just PCOS, but it's not. Right, that has nothing to do with the high androgens and PCOS or the insulin resistance that cause you to have severe moodiness and uh, uncontrollable crying and and, and you know that affects your social life. So don't let someone put that down to PCOS. Yes, hormonal balances uh, are systematic, so they include most systems in your body, and things are connected. And often, what we find is that when we improve our PCOS root cause then our hormones balance out and then we're not getting such severe PMS. That's kind of treating the root cause. It's not because of your PCOS that you're getting these symptoms, if that makes sense. So then what causes PMS or PMDD? Now, there can be a couple of causes, but they're all really related to hormonal fluctuation. That's greater than what it should be so there's an imbalance now I saw a post on Instagram the other day from a doctor and it was a graphical post saying it was like things to watch out for basically it was saying watch out for these woo woo functional medicine nutritionists naturopaths who are saying these things and and just dispelling them and one of her things was hormone imbalance and in the caption it was like your hormones are imbalanced. That's the whole way they work. You have a rise in estrogen in the first half of your cycle that that develops your egg and a rise in follicle stimulating hormone and then you ovulate and then your estrogen drops off and your progesterone rise. So, and in the first half of your cycle, your progesterone is low. And that post completely missed the point. We understand that hormones fluctuate. That is, that is a given and we probably understand that better than a lot of GPs because we are actively tracking cycles and measuring hormones at different stages to see when, whether they are optimal or not because we know that it's when hormones say for example your estrogen is too high or it's high when it should be low or your progesterone is not high enough that's when these symptoms occur and it's really common especially in PCOS because we have hormone imbalances that are leading to irregular cycles. So for many of you listening here, I know you'll be either getting really irregular cycles or maybe no period at all. And those irregular cycles could look like maybe 40, 50, 60, 90, 100 days in length. And what that means is that instead of just producing estrogen for two weeks, you might be producing it for 10 weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks and then you're producing progesterone maybe for only you know seven or eight days instead of producing it for 14 days and so you've got this complete imbalance in how much estrogen you're producing versus the amount of progesterone you're producing right and this is when that leads to symptoms like PMS and PMDD because those are so wildly out of kilter that it causes these symptoms so if you see people especially on social media, poo-pooing that idea. And I understand why it happens, right? People on social media need to be the loudest and often the most divisive to get attention. And so you often hear these quite extreme um, versions. And often people that are, especially medical professionals that are 
uh, on social media are there because they want to share their knowledge and their opinions and uh, when they think that something's not right and shared incorrectly then they're going to want to correct that but what I saw about that post that really got to me is that it really devalued and degraded your symptoms and your personal experience of having these hormone imbalances and saying well yeah (laughs) duh hormones are supposed to be unbalanced it's like yeah we understand that but not to this extent that I am suffering and these symptoms that I am getting uh, I don't think that they're normal so just remember yes hormones are supposed to fluctuate that's how we ovulate and that's how we get a period but they're not supposed to fluctuate that wildly and ideally we're supposed to produce a good amount of estrogen for about two weeks and then we ovulate and then a good amount of progesterone for again ideally around about 11 to 14 days and then we get a period when that drops off so if you've got many of these symptoms and you've got quite long cycles then there could be an imbalance in the amount of progesterone or estrogen that you are producing and therefore that's why you're getting these symptoms the other cause is being over the age of 30 and this is what my friends were discussing the other week that they had never had PMS symptoms before but now as they've moved into their 30s and mid 30s the PMS is suddenly hitting them and maybe it's not suddenly maybe it's been a gradual increase over a few years but they're really noticing quite severe changes now which are having an impact on their uh, yeah on, on their work and their relationships and their enjoyment in life now the reason for this is that both sex hormones decline in all females with age however between the ages of 35 and 50 progesterone drops by about 75 percent whereas estrogen only decreases by about 35 percent so again you've got this imbalance where your body is producing more estrogen relative to the amount of progesterone that it's producing and this is what it's actually probably a much better way of saying it than what I said before but the same thing is when if you're getting really long cycles it's likely that your body is producing relatively more estrogen than what it is progesterone so you've got a relatively a lot lower amount of progesterone and that can be what's causing those symptoms it's kind of like if you imagine when you know your body is leading up to ovulation so ovulation is this big sort of crescendo so you've got all of this estrogen and follicle stimulating hormone and it's sort of building up and building up and building up and then when you finally release that egg out and this for you might have been taken you know your body trying this multiple times and finally on day 50 or 60 of your cycle it finally is able to release this egg then because you um, have been producing so much estrogen in the lead up to this over those weeks your when your body then now starts to produce progesterone it's at a relatively to the amount of produced estrogen you've produced it's much much lower and it's it's like imagine you know when you're building up to this crescendo and your egg gets released out of the out of the egg I always think about this as like those pinball machines you know when you're on the pinball machine and you're suddenly getting a really good one and it like flies up and hits the top that's kind of what it's like it's like releasing out of the out of the ovary and then you have the sudden drop because you have much less progesterone in relation to estrogen so it's sort of like your hormones are falling off a cliff and that's what triggers all of those symptoms I mentioned before now the last cause and these can all be all be combined together so you might have PCOS and inherent hormone imbalance with that you might be over the age of you know 33 35 and you also might have something called histamine intolerance now histamine intolerance so histamine is a chemical released by cells in your immune system these are called mast cells and histamine is released in response to potential allergens so think when you get a bee sting if you're allergic you take an antihistamine so it calms down the amount of histamine that your body is producing because histamine is what causes a lot of the things like the swelling and the um, the pain because you're sending all those prostaglandins to the site and it is um, or, you know the redness and the heat and things like that that's often caused by the histamine that your body releases in response to that allergen the bee sting and so when you take a hist- antihistamine it calms that down so um, histamine works in without estrogen so it's quite complex but basically all you need to know is that estradiol which is your most common estrogen 
can cause your mast cells to release more histamine and also slow down the breakdown of histamine from your body. So if you have higher levels of estradiol, then you're more likely to have this issue. And you're likely to have it right before you ovulate. So I know this is a little bit different to what I've been talking about in the, you know, the one or two weeks before your period. But if you notice that you get these symptoms right before you ovulate, and then again, the week or so before your period, then it might be being caused by high histamine. Because when you ovulate is when your estrogen or estradiol is at its highest And then the week before your period is the week where if your progesterone is a bit low, then it's low relative to the amount of estrogen that your body has been producing. So some of the ways that you can know if histamine is a connection for you uh, is if you get symptoms like swelling or bloating, insomnia, anxiety, itchy skin, a runny nose, rashes, headaches or migraines and especially if those symptoms are relieved by taking an antihistamine. So for example if you get headaches or migraines um, before your period and you take an antihistamine and the antihistamine relieves the headache, I don't know if it will relieve the migraine, I'm not sure about that, you'd have to ask someone else, but if it relieves the headache then it's likely that histamine is a driver for your PMS symptoms and as I said it might not be the only thing you might also have relatively low progesterone compared to the amount of estrogen that you have which is driving these symptoms too oh and I just forgot hives would be another one that would be really common with histamine intolerance too just think anything that's sort of yeah allergy related so hives runny nose those are really really you know, obvious ones, things like headaches and stuff might not be so obvious, but if you take an antihistamine, does it improve that symptom? If it does, it's likely due with histamine. Now that's not a, uh, some symptoms I've seen not respond to an antihistamine, but then do respond to when we reduce, say, histamine, high histamine containing foods. So it's not a foolproof method, but it, if it definitely does help, then it is very, very likely that histamine is part of the picture for you. So then what's the answer? Is it to take antihistamines for the two weeks after you ovulate? Well, I'm sure that many of you with allergies have experienced antihistamines. You don't want to be taking them all the time because they can make you quite drowsy. I mean, I'm definitely not saying don't take them if you uh, want to see if they're helping you. But it's more about trying to fix the actual problem rather than just using a Band-Aid solution like an antihistamine. And that's only, of course, for people that where histamine is a issue. For many of you, it might be age, right? What are we going to do about that? We can't turn back time, unfortunately. So as always, my approach is to treat the problem, not necessarily just to cover the symptoms up. But I do see where sometimes symptom management can be really helpful and necessary, and maybe it's a thing that you want to do. So I always give you the options for that as well and then there are also some um, pharmaceuticals that can actually be really helpful in treating the problem so it's not all just you know diet and lifestyle modification so the first one that's really I mentioned antihistamines I don't think they're a long-term solution but maybe will help in the short term Um, the other one that can be more of a long-term solution won't necessarily be fixing the issue but it can absolutely help with the symptoms would be hormonal birth control so whether that's the um, oral combined pill or the progestin only pill whether that's the marina uh, or other IUD like the Skylena or I think it's Kylena as well um, those are all can help by stopping you from ovulating and therefore you are not producing your own estrogen nor progesterone you are given a synthetic estrogen and progestin in the combined pill for example that mimic what your body should be producing so it can help to stabilize those hormones so you're not getting such wildly fluctuating hormones and therefore all of the symptoms of PMS or PMDD. Now as I said before might not work for you and that's why I want to offer you some other alternatives that you can do. So one would be if you do find out that histamine is contributing to your PMS or PMDD, then it would be by reducing the amount of histamine stimulating foods that you're eating 
at around the time of ovulation and then the week or so before your period. So it doesn't have to be all the time, but I mean, that is kind of two weeks of the month if you're, if you are getting a regular cycle. So it can be a little bit harder, but I think for many people it can be really worth it. Now histamine, as I said before, it's your body's really producing an inappropriate amount of histamine to foods. So think of foods uh, like fermented foods. So wine, for example, is often very histamine, alcohol in general, uh, very histamine stimulating. And that's why, remember I said at the start of the podcast, that if you find that you have lower tolerance to alcohol the week or, or so before your period, or even around ovulation, then histamine could be Uh, could be a factor for you there. So other high histamine containing foods, so in terms of fruits, that would be citrus fruits, strawberries, bananas, pineapples and pears. Vegetables that would include eggplant, avocado, tomatoes, olives and beans. Dairy, so cheese, yogurt, processed cheese, so that's to do with the fermentation, so fermented foods are not going to be great because they have a lot of histamine. So anything else fermented, such as beer, wine, pickled foods, so things like uh, gherkins, uh, kombucha, sauerkraut, kimchi, or other fermented food or beverage. Uh, Drinks. Now, this is unfortunate because it it contains most of your your, um, caffeine-containing drinks. So coffee, black tea, And then orange juice, because that goes back to the citrus fruit, and lemon water again, that goes back to the citrus fruit again. So you're going to be on herbal teas and like cocoa and things like that. Now when it comes to your meat sources, then anything that would be processed, like deli meats, so salamis, ham, sausages, lunch meat, etc. Or any meats or fish that have been canned or dried or smoked. And then also eggs, unfortunately. Um, So you can have them in small amounts in baked products, but eggs on their own can be quite histamine stimulating. Now when it comes to grains, the grains you want to avoid is anything bleached. So bleached white flour, for example. When it comes to flavours, vinegar, obviously, because that's fermented. uh, So that would include anything like apple cider vinegar, soy sauce and hot spices as well. So those are your top histamine stimulating foods. Now as I said before, many of these foods are very healthy. It's not about healthy or not healthy foods, it's just that your body is producing too much histamine in response to many of those foods and that's why you're getting some symptoms. Now avoiding those foods for life is not the answer, but it can help in the interim in identifying if histamine intolerance or histamine overproduction is probably a better word is contributing to some of your symptoms and then it's about you know addressing why your body is producing so much histamine and maybe it's to do with the fact that your body's producing too much estrogen as well and fixing both of those by working with someone who knows what they're doing in this space and therefore helping with your PMS symptoms in the long run. This is kind of like the low FODMAP diet. If any of you have tried that for your IBS, so low FODMAP diet has been found to be very effective in improving symptoms of IBS. But it's not that, say, onions and garlic are causing your IBS. They are triggering that. And I don't, wouldn't want you staying on a low FODMAP diet for the rest of your life. It's about doing that in the meantime to improve your symptoms while we address the root cause, which is likely a gut bacteria issue, so that you can have just a much more freer diet for the rest of your life. And I'm really, really concerned about high levels of restriction, especially for people with PCOS who have had a history of disordered eating. So I don't want you to think that this is something that you have to maintain forever. It's just while we try and figure out what the actual problem is. So in terms of some of the other treatments for PMS, especially if you don't have histamine intolerance, would be firstly, if you're getting really irregular PCOS cycles, so if you're getting your cycle is either more than 35 days or you're tracking your cycle and you're getting a really short luteal phase. Now your luteal phase is the period of time after you have ovulated. So you should have at least 11 days after you ovulate and before you get your period. And you can tell this by measuring your basal body temperature. Basal body temperature is very, very, very accurate for uh, for detecting ovulation. 
And if anyone says to you, I don't believe in basal body temperature, well, they're not practicing evidence-based medicine because it is very clear in the literature that basal body temperature is a very good uh, indicator of ovulation. So I have two ways that I can help you with this. One is chapter nine of my book, Getting Pregnant with PCOS, is all about how to use basal body temperature and cervical fluid to determine when you are ovulating. So that would be even for if you're not trying to get pregnant, just trying to understand your cycles better, that chapter would be really relevant for you. Or I have a seven day mini course called Educated. So that's E-G-G-D-U-C-A-T-E-D.com. We'll put that in the show notes and you can you know, learn how to chart your cycles over seven days via that as well. Please don't use your app such as Clue when you just put in your period and then it uses an algorithm to guess when you have ovulated because that is only 60% accurate, i.e. not very accurate at all. So we want to actually know when you're ovulating to know if you do have a short luteal phase because if you do, then uh, you might need, this could be a reason for the PMS. So if you're getting either longer than 35 day cycles or your luteal phase is less than 11 days, then that is likely one of the drivers for your PMS because you are producing relatively more estrogen than you are progesterone, which is known as estrogen dominance. So the way that we improve that is through a couple of ways. One is we address the root cause. So why is your body struggling to ovulate? Because if you're in either of those instances, it's that your body hasn't been able to ovulate on the first attempt and therefore it's having to have either one or multiple attempts at ovulation. And so we want to try and improve your hormones so that your body can ovulate. And this is where it comes back to, well, what's actually driving your PCOS? This is known as your PCOS root cause or PCOS type. And is this insulin resistance? Is it high stress hormones? Is it your thyroid? Is it chronic inflammation? and or many other things that can contribute to those factors as well. So this is a long-term approach, right? You're not going to be able to, and I'm, I can't address this for you in one simple podcast. So I can help you with that through my program, The Peace Who's Protocol, where I work with you through that. It's not that you just get a PDF and sent on your merry way. We identify what is driving that for you and then help you with the most important changes for you. And you and I speak you know, every week if you want to on our live calls. So if you've got questions and you know things aren't quite matching up for you, we can dig in and figure out what's going on. So that would be the first thing that you want to do. And then the other treatment that can be quite helpful, especially for those that have either really long cycles and we're trying to shorten those, or a short luteal phase, or if you don't have PCOS and you are just over 30, over 35, and your progesterone is starting to decline, then micronized progesterone, which is a medication, but it's actually not like the pill. It's a bioidentical to your natural hormone progesterone. And this can be really helpful to be used cyclically. So in a cycle, so we use it at different times of your cycle, depending on what the problem is, to actually help top up your own bodily production of progesterone. So for example, in... My one of my friends who didn't have PCOS uh, was had just found that her PMS PMDD symptoms had got really bad over the last couple of years since getting into her mid thirties, and the problem with her was just overall low progesterone production. So she was had a really regular cycle every 28, 30 days, but just her progesterone was a lot lower in the second half of her cycle than what it should be. So micronized progesterone was a really simple fix for her. And we didn't need to do anything with estrogen. Her estrogen production was fine. It was just a relatively low amount of progesterone that she was producing. So in that instance, it was a really simple fix. After one month, the PMS symptoms had disappeared. But that's not the case with all women and especially not when we've got a combined issue of PCOS and really long cycles, we might have to do a couple of different treatments. So it would be about working with someone who knows what they're doing and knows how to prescribe that as well as how to modify your um, diet and lifestyle to help to manage your PCOS symptoms as well and get your cycle back very regular. The other things that can really help would be some vitamins and minerals. So vitamin B6 can be a real game changer when it comes to 
uh, PMS symptoms. So the form of vitamin B6 that you want is P5P. Now the reason vitamin B6 or P5P works so well is because it's essential for the production of your steroid hormones like progesterone. It's also involved in the manufacturing of your brain neurotransmitters, which include GABA, dopamine and serotonin. And this is why, especially for mood symptoms, this can be a game changer. Now, many people have either reduced um, B6 intake in their diet or a reduced ability to convert or absorb vitamin B6. So sometimes taking a higher amount can be really helpful and make sure it is that P5P form as well. The other reasons it can really help is because it lowers your histamine. So again, if you have those histamine symptoms, think the hives and the headaches and uh, runny nose, all those things I mentioned before, then taking some P5P might be really helpful for PMS symptoms there. And finally, because it's an anti-inflammatory. And again, thinking back to that histamine connection, if you've got histamine is one of your immune cells and that's going to um, drive some inflammation. Now, B6 is found in food. So it's found in fish and poultry and nuts. Um, but I would say in most cases, you would need more than what you're getting from food to have an impact on PMS symptoms. Again, that's because, as I said before, sometimes there's deficiencies, sometimes there's your genetically inability, unable to convert it or absorb it. And so, yeah, I would say definitely try from food sources, but also a supplement as well. The other mineral that can be really helpful is magnesium. Magnesium is something that I recommend most people take because we just don't get enough in our diet. I think the statistic is the average Western diet only gives us, I think it's about less than 50% of the magnesium that we need. So it's really important and really, you know, much harder to get your actual level in your diet. Now, magnesium is also really helpful for that brain neurotransmitter GABA and it can help regulate your stress response so you're not producing as much stress hormone in relation to what your body is experiencing or what your brain's experiencing. And interestingly, it's been proposed by researchers as even the cause of PMS, that is magnesium deficiency. So definitely an easy and cheap one to try and see if that helps. I generally, depending on how much I, they might be getting from food, but generally recommend around about 500 milligrams of magnesium a day. And also, if you've got some insulin resistance, magnesium is super important for your insulin to work properly. So it's kind of a win-win there. So in summary, PMS and PMDD are very common things, but it's not normal. What is normal is for your period to arrive without a lot of fanfare and not having these weeks of horror before your period. So if you are getting a lot of these symptoms and it is affecting your quality of life, then please get on and work with someone who can help you identify what's causing the issues and then what a suitable treatment would be. And that can often be a couple of different practitioners, right? You might have someone who helps you with your dietary and lifestyle guidance for improving your PCOS root cause and bringing your cycles back to normal. And then also you have a doctor that maybe needs to prescribe you some micronized progesterone to help bring your progesterone levels up uh, in the meantime. And so it doesn't have to be just one person that you're looking for. It can be a combination. And this is what I really recommend is that you have a, a cultivate a team around you, a team of, of great people that can help you with managing your symptoms in your body. If you'd like me to help you with that, then I, as I said before, I can help you with the PCOS protocol, which is my 12-week program. In the first week, I help you identify what's driving your PCOS. And then the following 12 weeks, um, you get a daily little task, which really is about you sort of have one task a week, but every day there's something new that you can watch or help you implement that new habit. And then every week we have our live video calls where we can chat if you need some help further implementing something or it's not stacking up for you. So if you want to know more about that, then head to the PCOSnutritionist.com forward slash the PCOS protocol, or we have a link in the show notes as well. And 
As I also mentioned before, we have our seven-day mini course on how to chart your cycles to understand when you are ovulating. That's called Educated and that's in the show notes. Or my book, Getting Pregnant with PCOS. Now, even if you're not trying to conceive at the moment, many of those chapters would be relevant for you. I often do get this question. And yes, of course, there'll be chapters that are not relevant, like the medical treatments for fertility. But most of the chapters, because most of my philosophy around PCOS is exactly the same. Doesn't really matter what the symptom is. So, for example, if you're suffering from hirsutism, the same thing would apply getting to the root cause. If you're suffering from acne, same thing applies. So most of the chapters are relevant. It will just be, I think, definitely chapter four and five that's not. But you can easily skip through those parts that aren't relevant anyway. So I hope that that helps you understand a bit more about PMS, PMDD, what's causing it, and what potential treatments there are for you and we'll see you next week when we talk all about iron levels and PCOS so think iron like the thing that everyone says when you're tired you're like oh maybe you've got iron deficiency well we're going to be talking about why actually high iron too much iron is potentially more common in PCOS and can be more of an issue so we will see you then for the episode bye for now now stand by for our disclaimer The information contained in this podcast has been prepared for the purpose of providing information including about the PCOS nutritionist products and services and is designed to support clients' overall wellness. It is not intended to provide medical advice or designed to rectify, treat or cure any specific medical conditions or diseases. Nothing stated or shared in our podcast is intended to be and must not be taken to be medical advice. Please seek the advice of professionals as appropriate regarding the evaluation of any specific information, opinion, advice or content contained in our podcast.